hello ladies. As you can see, I'm not there in the sanctuary with you. I am here in my house. And uh, so welcome to the Heitzig home. Um, if I could, I would have you all over. Um, I'm famous for tea and uh, I love having a cup. I make a pot almost every day. So if I could, I'd have you here and we'd be drinking tea. So turn in your Bibles now to Ruth, the fourth chapter. I am loving this study, Live Beautifully, of Ruth and Esther. And uh, we've seen so much so far. We've seen um, as Naomi and her husband escaped to Moab and then had a disastrous time where uh, the son dies, both sons die, the husband dies, and they've made their way home. And uh, we've also been at the threshing floor as Ruth has snuck in at night in her most beautiful clothes and she's anointed with oil and she lays at Boaz's feet. And this is the culmination. Today is the day that Boaz will redeem her. So my lesson today is called My Redeemer Lives. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you that uh, we have not been redeemed with gold or silver or anything that man could accomplish or do, Lord. The price for our redemption, for our freedom, from our releasing from the bondage of sin was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we can relate to Ruth. We can relate to be, being someone who is caught in slavery and poverty because we have been poor in spirit. And so we just thank you and ask you to give us eyes to see new things today as we look at your word. Amen. Well, you guys know redemption is pretty tender to my heart based on the work we do with Reload Love, that uh, I've had the opportunity to be in Jordan with Syrian refugees and Iraq with uh, Yazidi and Christian refugees and uh, in different parts in the world, in Burma and Thailand with the Karen tribes who are refugees. And so they know this life. They know that their lives are not their own and that something has come in and it changed their worlds. And I was reading an article that was just out a couple months ago. And so far, Abdullah Shrim has redeemed, has saved more than 300 Yazidi women from slavery. When ISIS came in 2014 across the plains of Syria and into the Yazidi region, into the Iraqi region, they went from house to house and separated men and women. Um, over 6,000 men, they say in this article, were mowed down in mass graves. And uh, I've had the privilege with a friend here that we've been in front of those mass graves. And it's sobering. And uh, at that time, uh, it had not been completely cleared and there had not been forensics. So many women didn't know if their husbands, fathers, uncles were in those mass graves. Additionally, there were over 6,000 women who were kidnapped. They would separate the men from the women, the men they would mow down, and then the women they would take for sex slavery. They would be sold to ISIS soldiers and then carted all over the caliphate, uh, wherever these soldiers happened to go, many of them in Syria, uh, since that was the last stronghold. Shrim, uh, when this kidnapping happened in 2014, had 56 relatives that were taken, that were kidnapped. Don't even have words for that when it's your whole uh, family, your sisters, aunts, uncles, mothers are gone. And uh, one day uh, he got a phone call from Raqqa, Syria, which was the capital of the caliphate at the time. And it was uh, one of his nieces. And uh, she called and said where she was and she asked, come help me, come get me. And he didn't know what he could do, but he had friends in Syria, so he called them. And they told them, your best bet is to go with the black market and come in smuggling cigarettes because cigarettes were illegal in the caliphate. So this was contraband. So he was able to go in and secure the freedom of his niece. Well, since then, he's released 300 other ladies. And as recent as 2017 and 18, there are still women in captivity from ISIS. What he did is so clever. He set up a bakery in Syria and then he stocked it with undercover women. And these women would go door to door to sell bread or the sweets. And when they knocked on the door, they could go inside and see the ladies without their black hijabs. So they would be able to identify them, see if they spoke Kurdish or spoke some of the dialect that would have been from Iraq. And then they would concoct a plan to rescue them. Um, at that time, the prices, a low end price was $3,000. 
to bring one of your relatives out of sex trafficking and slavery under the hands of an ISIS soldier in that horrible black flag that they flew. At the top end, it was maybe $15,000. And we remember talking to friends who were trying to negotiate these things um, in different organizations we work with. And a lot of people were saying, you shouldn't do this because you're giving money to ISIS. I don't know. If it was your sister, would you give the money to ISIS? Probably you would. And um, by 2017, they believed that of the 6,417 Yazidis that were kidnapped, that over 3,000 were still in captivity. So this act continues. Uh, working with this was Hiwa Aziz. He was the former intelligence officer for Kurdistan. And a reporter recently met with him in Erbil, which is where we base when we go to Iraq. And he was flipping through his phone, showing the pictures of the thousands, the hundreds of girls that are still missing. And uh, what they've discovered is that uh, some of these women currently, to support ISIS, as they're being stomped out, are selling these girls into sex trafficking to other countries like Egypt. And then this is a travesty we've learned in Cambodia and other places. Many of the children are being trafficked for their organs. That there are rich uh, people in the Arab Gulf countries that are willing to buy a child to get a liver or a kidney or a heart. So, when we jump into this, I want you to know there are still people alive today that their heart and soul and their lives are not their own, and how they dream and pray for a redeemer, someone who would pay the price to set them free. And I guess I'd like to ask you the question, how much would you pay if it was your daughter, it was your sister, your cousin, your aunt, at one time, the Daily Beast had an article that said, how to buy a girl from ISIS. It's a shame that I can even search the internet and find an article that would tell me how to do this. Well, our text today in Ruth chapter 4, 10 times the word redeem is used. And you learned in your homework that redeemed means to release by paying a price or to buy back as in buying a slave's freedom. Now, you may not relate especially to this concept because you've never been taken captive against your will. But I would say to you, the Bible says that you have been taken captive by a much darker entity than the black flag of ISIS, and that would be sin. The Bible says before we are saved, we were slaves to sin, and that Satan has taken hearts captive. Paul said, you are slaves of sin in Romans 6.16, and then he warned that the wages of sin is death. Apart from Christ, there is a darkness, there is a bondage. You may not recognize it as that, but I would ask, what enslaves you? I have a relative that is agoraphobic and won't leave her house. Is she a slave to her fears and her problems? I have another friend that uh, her husband lives in the basement most of the day because it's the only place he's allowed to smoke. Is that a bondage? Is that something you're held captive to? I had an in-law who was having a problem with obesity and she would get up in the middle of the night and eat a cake and then make a brand new one so in the morning no one would know she ate the cake because different things enslave us. I've had different things enslave me. It could just be to please man. It could be the way you look. It could be the scales. It could be being gluten-free. It could be social media. Um, there are so many things. Maybe it's binging on Netflix. Uh, whatever it is, there are certainly things that come into our lives, and before we know it, we're caught. And then we're paying the piper for that particular thing. Like it or not, we live under Satan's caliphate. You see, the caliphate of ISIS was a land mass, as well as a theology, a principle, an ideology. They wanted to get the land in Iraq and Syria and Turkey and some of these areas so that the, they could establish this uh, state. Um, Satan has done that on the earth. In 1 John 5, 19, it says, the world around us is under control of the evil one. So you might say, we need a redeemer who would redeem the world, the planet, and would redeem us as a result of it. 
And that's where we see Ruth today. They have had to hawk their land, hawk their fields, Naomi and Ruth. They have nothing left and the fields are going to go up for sale. But on the day that the fields sold, so comes the life of Ruth the Moabites so that she can continue the generations of the family. So if you want to look at uh, Ruth chapter 4, it says, Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Come aside, friend. Sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold a piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of the people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me, that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. So he said, I will redeem it. This is the beginning. There's a negotiation. And you'll see that we're shifting now from a private place of the threshing floor where Ruth snuck in at night and it was nightfall and dark and she was at the feet of Moaz, uh, Boaz and now they're in the city gates. So we see Boaz is going to be the foreshadowing. He's going to be the image, if you will, of another redeemer who came in the New Testament, who is Jesus Christ, who would secure our emancipation with his blood. So we're going to look at three things in this today. First, the powerless redeemer, the closest kinsman. Number two, the passionate redeemer that will be Boaz. And then finally, the predicted redeemer, because this reflects Jesus Christ, the reflected redeemer who had come in the New Testament. So the place they're going to meet is not private, as I said, it's in public, and they go to the city gates. And that might not make sense to us today in this culture, but in the old world, in biblical times, most cities had a wall around them because there were raiding bandits. There were constant fights for people to have the land throughout the Middle East, just like there is today with the ISIS and caliphate. If you go to Megiddo, um, there is a false hill that has been created. Uh, they're called tells. A tell is a false hill that is made up of rubble of one civilization atop of the other. So it's not a natural geographic hill. It's a hill that's been made by conquering hordes and the layers beneath it. There are 23 layers in Megiddo. And so Megiddo has this wall system around it. The walls would go around the city to protect the city. And then there would be an intricate system that was the city gates. And the city gates were often two, three, four layers deep and often created in a zigzag pattern. Because if you come riding it as a crusader on your horse and you try and go through the gate, but then the gate turns and then the gate turns, it slows down your access to the gate. Also, they would have metal bars that would come down. They'd boil hot oil and pour that down to give you a warm welcome to the city. And so there were all these intricate things that came with the gates in Israel. So in peaceful times, these gates had all kinds of seats, stone seats in them. And that's where the elders would come. And since this was the inlet and outlet of the city, everybody else would come. They would be selling their food from the fields or, you know, traveling caravans were bringing things in. So four things happened in the city gates in the ancient times. Number one, there were business transactions in the city gates. Um, Abraham, back in his day, went to the city gate to secure a burial place for Sarah. He came and said, I need a place, and so he did that transaction there. The second thing that happened in city gates is there was justice administered. Um, in Joshua, murder trials happened in the city gates. So this was a place where the judges would come. Thirdly, they were a place of politics. And uh, you have politics now on bumper stickers or people's uh, signs in their yards. But in this day, you would be kissing babies and shaking hands in the city gates. And that's exactly what Absalom did. When Absalom, the son of David, wanted to overthrow his father, he went to the city gates and he schmoozed everyone he could to create a coup.
And then finally, there were marketing matters. People bought and sold their wares in the gates. So this was a very crowded place. And Boaz says, hey, come with me to the gates. Remember, come on, you know, come with me, this closer relative. And he invites 10 elders, you saw here. An elder literally means an aged person with a beard. I don't know if that means I have to grow a beard. Uh, <laughs> now that I'm older, uh, but you get my idea. These were the heads of the leading families, and they were probably based on age. I got to love the Old Testament because they valued older people. They valued age. So um, my friends, you gray-haired silver saints whom I love so much, we value you. You would have been valued in the city gates. We would have wanted your wisdom and your understanding and your knowledge. And uh, these people had authority to judge over murder trials, disputes about virginity, uh, property redemption, and love right marriages, which is what's going to happen in this text. And then you notice there were 10 elders. 10, for whatever reason, seems to designate the smallest, most complete group of elders. In fact, in New Testament times, when they were building synagogues, if you come with us to Israel, you'll see in Caesarea the most beautiful synagogue. It took at least 10 families to create a synagogue. So what, for whatever reason, 10 is a special number. So they go to this place and they make a proposition. He says, you know, Naomi's back and we have the property of Elimelech, and if you want to redeem it, you get to pay that price. If not, I will. Now, hidden within this is a proposal. Imagine Ruth is sitting you know, somewhere in the crowds watching Boaz, and she knows it's her life. Whoever says yes is going to be the man she marries. It's, it's more intriguing than The Bachelor which I don't watch, but anyway, I hear that we're all rooting for whoever it is that's going to get this millionaire guy and have a happily ever after. Ruth is there, and somewhere in this, I want to make this land transaction with you, is a proposal. It's kind of odd, right? If he gets the ground, he gets the girl. And so it's like a two-in-one proposal. And at first, he doesn't even mention the maiden, does he? He makes it sound like this is merely a transaction. It kind of reminds me of Skip's proposal to me. Um, Skip and I had been dating long distance. I was in Hawaii, and he was in California. And things were getting, you know, like, come on, baby, let's see what God's got for us. So I did. I came home. But when I got here, he had been in... Um, Albuquerque, spying out the land to see if Skip and I should move here and start a church. And the night he got home from Albuquerque, I think he had set in his heart he was going to ask me to marry him. And you guys know that Skip is loquacious. He's really good with words. Well, he started telling me about shifting sand dunes and stoplights going green and yellow and this whole thing. And all of a sudden, I'm going, oh my gosh, I think he's going to ask me to marry him. And before you know it, somewhere in that long, drawn out yarn, he did. So I said, Skip, I think you asked me to marry you, and if you did, the answer is yes. Literally, my husband jumps up from the couch, not then husband, fiance, and he goes, wait, did I ask you to marry me? And if I did, I have to go to the bathroom, and then we need to talk. <laughs> so not all proposals <laughs> come with roses and uh, something sparkling, and yeah, I didn't have a ring at the time, and either did Ruth. So the closer relative responds, he goes, I'll do it. And uh, he had the privilege to be able to do that. In Leviticus 25, 26, it says, If any of your Israelite relatives go bankrupt and are forced to sell some inherited land, then choose a close relative, a kinsman redeemer, who may buy it back from them. So the Old Testament gave this way to keep the property within the family so that this family would not go bankrupt. They'd have food. So they're going to find a relative, the closest relative, and that person could be the kinsman redeemer. Boaz pretty much tells the brother, though, don't forget there's some fine print here. He goes, the day you get the land, you have to get the lady. And so this causes the man to maybe think about it. So he was saying pretty much read the fine print. Do you read the fine print? 
because I don't. My personality is just to march ahead. Now, my friend, my daughter-in-law, Janae, she's a fine print person. She lives at the fine print, but I don't. And I was laughing the other day when I was reading some product labels, and um, I was cracking up. Sears has a hair dryer that says, do not use while sleeping. Now, a lot of us would like to save time in the morning, but taking the blow dryer to bed clearly is not a good uh, idea. Rowenta Iron has one that says, do not iron clothes on your body. Now, I do have to say I've used my curling iron before, <laughs> yeah. so it, it's not quite the Rowenta, but I have used my curling iron in a pinch. And then finally, a Superman costume came with warning, this garment does not enable you to fly. Oh man, I was going to go get one, you know, all my I'm going to get an umbrella like Mary Poppins and jump off the roof, I don't know. But there was some fine print that uh, Boaz wanted him to look at. And the problem was found in verse 5. The day you buy the field from Naomi, you must buy it from Ruth the Moabitess to perpetuate the name of the dead. And that's part of this kinsman redeemer. He's not just redeeming the land. He would redeem a widow so that they could raise up an heir to the name of the person who had passed. I want you to notice that Boaz is still not very romantic because he just called her a foreigner. Maybe that would be equal at our time to say an immigrant, maybe an illegal immigrant. How did she come across the border? Has she become part of this system in Israel? So you can sympathize that Ruth is probably the lowest of the low. She's been out working in the field, picking the harvest, like many immigrants do. And then he adds the caveat, not just any immigrant, he says she's a Moabitess. Now, if you understood what Moab was back in those days, you'd know that that was another pot shot. Moab is the land region of Jordan, and they're not very friendly with the Israelites. But the way the Moabites came to be is when Lot was escaping Sodom, he had incestuous affairs with his two daughters so that they could continue their lineage. Moab is the son of Lot and his oldest daughter. So this was kind of a scourge. If you were a Moabite, you were an inbred. You came from, uh, you know, really shaky beginnings. So Boaz is saying she's a foreigner and she's a Moabitess. Now maybe he was saying this so that he was devaluing the property. Maybe there's a little, you know, bargaining in this thing. But he sure wants them to know there's strings attached and that an heir would have to be raised up to Malon her son who had deceased. Unlike chapters two and three, and largely the book of Ruth and Esther, we are not emphasizing on providence in this moment. We now focus on choice, not chance. In this moment, the nearer kinsman has a choice. Do I redeem her or not? And then Boaz will be given the choice. And the closer relative says no. He declines to do it. Ruth 4, 6, he says, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. And now turns to a really weird thing that happens. Do you remember he takes his shoe off during this transaction? If you turn uh, to your Bibles to Deuteronomy 25, <clears throat> you'll see this really weird thing in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 25 verse 5 says, If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as a wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn son shall bear, uh, which she bears, will succeed to the name of the dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to raise up a name of his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak to him. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, 
Then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face, answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. So ladies, that guy won't marry you, just a loogie. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what's happening here. She could, you know, and just go for it, which is pretty gross. Um, so a loogie, and then you can take off your shoe and hit him with it. And um, I don't know. I would go for the stiletto. <laughs> Just saying, ultimate damage if he's not going to do this for you. And it seems that the relative of Boaz already was married and he didn't want to cause problems. It probably implies not that he wouldn't, but that he couldn't afford to do it because his heir would be tainted now and this land would have to go to Ruth's heir and so it made things complicated for him. But it's pretty amazing to the depths that Boaz will go to rescue an immigrant, a Moabitess, a poor peasant who works in a field. You remember, of course, World War II and uh, when the Jews were being rounded up and sent to concentration camps. And what we would do now, the likes of Schindler trying to res rescue them, or Corey Ten Boom, had we known the stakes. Had we just known, you know, many people. Penelope Duckworth, a chaplain from Stanford University, met a Christian who adopted a Jewish daughter. And the way she did it was pretty amazing. She said after Hitler annexed Poland, the Nazis came to her village to deport Jews. While shopping at the train station, kind of like the city gates, German soldiers were loading Jews into a rail car to concentration camps. Just then a sh soldier pushed a Jewish toward the station, and she had a little girl toddling behind her. He stopped and he demanded, is she your daughter? The terrified mother pleadingly looked at the Christian and woman and said, no, she's hers. From that day on, the woman took the child, and it was hers. Sometimes the price of redemption is the price that's so much more than money, isn't it? And so that's what we're going to see happen with Boaz. So this is the powerless redeemer. And now we move in verse 7 to the passionate redeemer, to uh, Boaz himself. Verse 7, it says in our text, sorry. Verse 7 says, Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm anything, one man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, Buy it yourself, and he took off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elder and to all the people, You are my witnesses this day that I bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Kilion's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitist, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are my witnesses this day. So now we get to see that Boaz is going to be able to do what he's been wanting to do. Now there were qualifications for a kinsman redeemer that we've been talking about in Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and in Ruth. And the qualifications were number one, you must be related. It says you must take a near relative. And we learned right away in chapter 2 that Boaz came to the field and he was a near relative. So we know Boaz is related. The second thing is he must be able. He has to have the money, right? If he can't pay for it, he can't get it. And we remember that they said Boaz, a wealthy man, came to the field on the day of harvest. And then finally, you must be willing. The closer relative was unwilling, but Boaz was willing, and you hear what he says, you are my witnesses this day that I have bought all, but moreover, Ruth, the Moabitist. Um, Oswald Chambers said it like this, God redeemed the human race when we were spitting in his face, as it were. You know, we were fighting against our kinsman redeemer. 
We were in sin. We shook our fists. We made our little stands, stomped our little feet. In Romans 5, verse 7, it says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We see this reflection of Jesus Christ and his willingness to rescue us. Now, I know very little of redemption, except for one little story when Nathan was about three. He was not an easy person to potty train, and we were getting near, near his third birthday, and we were still not getting the dry diaper result we looked for. So I did what any mother would do. I bribed him. <laughs> I said, if you will go potty in the toilet, we'll get you a puppy. And sure enough, we drove down to the Humane Society, and we were walking down death row, looking at all the inmates, and there was a beautiful ginger cocker spaniel in there, and Nathan wanted Goldilocks really bad. <laughs> and so uh, we only had to pay the price to redeem Goldilocks from her fate, worse than death. And uh, she came home and lived with us, and Nathan had dry diapers. So there was a purchase that happened here, and in it was the proposal. Did you see that? Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. It's a strange proposal. He says, I have acquired. Now, I don't know that any of you would like your intended to say, can I acquire you? I'd like to own you. I mean, is he putting her in his pocket? What's happening here? The Hebrew word here, moreover, is vagam, and it places a greater emphasis on what follows. In other words, he's emphasizing that he's getting a wife. Boaz is wealthy. He doesn't need the real estate He's looking for a relationship. He wants the lady, not merely the land. And so there is a beautiful proposal in there. And then he goes on, and um, there's this proclamation from the women in the city. And it's the strangest proclamations. There's just a little bit of oddity. So they were all there, and they said, We are witnesses, verse 11. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper at Ephratath and in, be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be the house of Perez, whom Tamer bore to Judah, because the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. So they make a proclamation. It's this kind of idea of making a witness. Have you ever heard that? Can I have a witness? Well, he did this on purpose. The 12 elders were witnesses, right? Now the crowds, can I get a witness? And then finally the crowds are going to say, oh yeah, we'll give you a witness and we're going to give you a blessing too. And their blessing is funny. It's trying to validate their future. And he says, may you be like Rachel and Leah. Well, as you know, Rachel and Leah are the founding mothers of Israel. It was between the two of them and their handmaidens that the 12 descendants, the 12 tribes, came from. So these witnesses are kind of saying that Ruth and Boaz, we hope you have great fertility, that you will have many children, and that you will become a great tribe. And little do they know that they're being prophetic. Because we see when the child is born, his name is Obed. And then Obed becomes the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David, and David, and the lineage goes all the way to Jesus Christ. So this is a beautiful genealogical blessing that the witnesses are giving. And then here's the one that's a little twisty. They say, may you be like Pera, Perez, whom Tamar bore. If you guys remember, Tamar was married to one of Judah's sons, and he died. And he would not give another son to Tamar. So she would be without husband, without son, without property, without prospects. And so she tricks Judah, right? She dresses up like a whore, like a harlot. She sits along the city. Judah comes into her and she gets pregnant. He's livid that he finds out the widow of his son is pregnant. And he says, you know, she should be stoned. And she says, well, the guy who did it gave me this. Tell me whose signet ring this is. 
and it was Judah's. So bringing Tamar into the conversation is another tainted woman in the lineage of Jesus Christ. But aren't I a tainted woman? Weren't there things in my past that if you looked in my closet and you pulled out my skeletons, I would be ashamed, and yet I've become part of Christ's family. So they make this comment, and uh, they're saying that, you know what? Yahweh invites foreigners into the fold. We've seen that in Joshua. You know what? When Rahab, the harlot, becomes a part of them. We've seen it with Tamar. We now see with Ruth. Isaiah 56, 6 says, Foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, and to worship him, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. God, so often we think he has no room for those on the outside, from those of another religion, another race, another socioeconomic place for Republicans, for Democrats, for whatever. We think somebody surely must be excluded. And in this text, we're learning that God has said from the beginning, there's a place for foreigners who want to follow me. My house will be a house of prayer for all nations. I read a funny thing about a pastor who always has a Bible verse for everything. It's kind of like Skip. And one Sunday he was preaching outside and when he was preaching a bug flew into his mouth and he said he was a stranger and I took him in. Um, but anyway, we as a church must invite strangers into our midst. You know what? Jesus loves prostitutes. Jesus loves addicts. Jesus loves immigrants. Jesus loves widows. Jesus loves, and there's a place at the cross for anyone from any background because he is our kinsman redeemer. So now we'll jump to this predicted redeemer. Verse 17, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. In other words, the lineage is going to come all the way to Jesus Christ through the loins of Ruth the Moabitess. Now that's redemption. That is the beauty. Have you ever met someone or seen a picture or watched TV and you go, that reminds me of someone else? Who is that guy? Or, you know, the other day some lady came up to me and she goes, you remind me of this actress. And I was pleased and I don't want to know the name. Someone once told me they, I reminded them of Florence Henderson. Oh. I was like, it's okay. The, when she was the Brady Bunch mom. I mean, that's all right. It could have been better, you yeah. know. But anyway, <laughs> have you ever had that happen? That happens in our family all the time because Nathan is the spitting image of his dad. And uh, one day, Skip brought out pictures of his dad and his uncle. And he had an uncle named Vin. And Vin looks just like Nathan, like Skip. And now Seth is following in those footsteps. When you see them, it's like a triple look-alike contest. And so when we look at Boaz, we're also looking at someone just like him. And that would be Jesus Christ. Um, Kinsman Redeemer is one of the clearest foreshadowings and pictures of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And the New Testament uses one of the most tender expressions to speak of you and I, and that is the bride of Christ. When you think about it, Jesus Christ came to redeem the earth under the sway of Satan so that he could secure from himself a foreign bride, a Gentile bride, you and I, the bride of Christ. Now, is Jesus qualified to be our Redeemer? Remember, they have to be ready, willing, and able. Is Jesus ready? Is he related? Well, it says, God in human flesh, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Why did God want the incarnation of his Son, his only begotten Son, that he would be related to us, that he would be flesh and blood? A poet put it like this, he stepped down from heaven, past constellations, into the Milky Way, onto a speck of dust called earth, and then stopped at an insignificant 
significant city, Bethlehem, into the womb of a peasant girl. That is God disrobing himself of all glory, majesty, authority from the throne room of heaven, from rainbows and brightness and angels. God in human flesh condescended to take on this rotting flesh that he could redeem us. Hebrews explains it this way, the children have flesh and blood. He too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery. I don't know about you, but these are scriptures that make me want to weep. When I look at Boaz and then I see what Jesus did. Was he ready? Was he related? Absolutely. His incarnation is a miracle. Was he willing? In John 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down and the power to take it again. Oh, Jesus was willing. He was so willing that he was willing to be nailed to the cross. And he says, no one could have taken my life from me. I and I alone can lay it down. And what did he say at the end? It is finished. What was that word? Tetelestai. What does tetelestai mean? Paid in full. My debt, your debt, the debt of humanity was paid at the cross. Now, why was Boaz willing? I would say to you, love. He admired her from afar. He said, you are a virtuous woman. She came to him and she said, oh, blessed are you that you could have picked more handsome men, younger men, richer men, but you've come to me. He loved her. And isn't that the same of Jesus Christ? He loves us. For God so loved the world, he gave his son. The motivating factor is love. Nails didn't keep Jesus Christ on the cross love did. That's what put him up there. So he was ready, he was willing, and he's able. The riches of Christ, he had the price, he had the ransom, he had the ability to pay. Jesus is able to pay the price. Paul said in Ephesians 1 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. It is by grace we are saved, through faith, not of ourselves. There's nothing I can do, no work, no accomplishment, nothing that could bring salvation to my life. Ruth could not have redeemed herself, and we could not either. Jesus Christ paid it all. To redeem us, our kinsman redeemer also had to redeem the earth. Matthew 13, Jesus told this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for the joy of it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Ladies, your engagement ring, you the pearl of great price. You are his pearl. And that's why he saved us. And finally, I love the idea of prediction in this passage. Because if you hold up Ruth chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 4, it is like seeing parallel scenes, one on earth and one in heaven. And it's astounding the uh, identical things that happened in these passages. So I brought two of them here today. And I want you to see what was happening on earth and what was happening in heaven. And I'm gonna hold them side by side so that you can look at them. And then I'm gonna just tell you. On earth, it happened at the gates, right? In heaven, it's at the pearly gates. In Re Revelation 4, 1. The 10 elders presided on earth. In heaven, there's 24 elders who bow down and cast their crowns. It was an earthly, earthly relative who said, come aside. Come to the gates with me. We have an earthly relative, remember John, the revelator? He was told, come up here. Come up here and see what's about to happen. The redeemer needed to have the title for the land. 
of the family. In Revelation 5.5, 5, it says that the lamb came forth and he loosed the seals and he opened it up and it was the deed for the earth, that he saved the earth. In Ruth 4, Boaz received a Gentile bride. In Revelation 5.9, Jesus receives a Gentile bride. Finally, in uh, Ruth 4.14, it says the witness the witnesses proclaim a blessing. And finally, in Revelation 4.11 and 5.12, witnesses give blessing and say, all glory and honor and power and majesty be unto him, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There is such beauty in this, the picture of our Redeemer. Oh, it's not going to restick. Okay. So in Ruth 4, redemption is mentioned 10 times. And 10 times buy or bought is said. Nowhere are we given the price of redemption. We don't know how much it costs. We just know it must have been costly that the two richest guys were the ones in the bidding. And that's how they got it. It was so costly that the nearer kinsman could not afford the price. He could not afford having Ruth in his family. I go back to what would you pay to redeem one of your family members? What would you be willing to do? That Yassidi man, he was willing to pay $3,000 to $15,000 and open a bakery and do everything he can. Schindler gave all that he could to get as many as he could from the furnaces of the concentration camps. You know, there are Sudanese refugees, just like I've told you of other refugees. They're being bombed in the Nuba Mountains. They're Christians in the Sudan. Sudanese region. Reload Love has been able to work with these refugees who have gone to uh, Uganda. And uh, so we've built playgrounds there, but they'd love to go home. Do you know that the average price to redeem a Sudanese slave is $50 to $100? The average price is two goats. There's an organization called Christian Solidarity International, and they've collected over a million dollars which means they have redeemed 20,000 people, two goats. Some critics, like the ISIS critics, say you shouldn't do that because you're only funding this horrible problem. But these activists say if it was your child or wife or sister that had been captured in a slave raid and you heard you could buy him back for $50, would you even ask that question? Sometimes we pay a price, no matter what the price is. And I, I think about me and my family members and people that I know that have not received the redemption of Jesus Christ, that have not made that prayer and just said, Jesus, you know, be my redeemer, save me, forgive me of my sins, let your blood cover me, let your blood buy me back from the slavery that I've been in. And I thought of this hymn this morning as I was writing this, and I love it. I remember hearing it some years ago. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, all day long. Jesus Christ paid the debt I could never pay. So as we close, I just would like you all to think of um, family members, friends, neighbors, people that need that redemption of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would be a conveyance, that you could be like one of these Sudanese people It takes two goats. You could be like our friend in Iraq, that maybe it's $3,000. I don't know what it is it would take to reach your family member, but whatever it is, do it. If it's a phone call, if it's a letter, if it's traveling to visit them, whatever it is, at any cost, Boaz was willing to pay it, and Jesus Christ was willing to pay it, and I want to encourage you to pay it forward. Take what you have and make sure that many others enjoy the benefits that you have received. In Jesus' name. <laughs>